Yeah, good morning, good afternoon, evening, whatever it is for you when you're watching this talk. I'm super excited to be here and to be talking about making motion inclusive with you um, today or whenever you're watching this. So um, it's a common misconception that things like inclusive design and accessibility only come, like can only come at the cost of design details like motion, but that, that really isn't the case. It's just the thing we kind of hold on to, but it doesn't have to be that way at all. Whether it's micro interactions, animated illustrations, or even larger animated experiences, you absolutely can be purposeful and creative and expressive without sacrificing accessibility and inclusion. It's really all about how we approach it. Now, inclusive design is one of those things that like if you asked, I don't know, five people what inclusive design was, you'd probably get five different definitions. But my favorite framing of inclusive design uh, usually comes up around that story that you've probably heard before around the design of like airplane uh, fighter jet cockpits. If you haven't heard this one before, um, there's a really great episode of 99% Inclusive, uh, that podcast that goes through the story in great detail. But the main points that are that kind of really made um, really made the idea of inclusive design resonate with me was the part of the story where they talk about how the cockpits were originally designed to, to fit the measurements of the average pilot. And they realized along the way that there was no actual real pilot person, like physical person, who had the exact average measurements. So by designing the cockpit for the average pilot, they were kind of or exactly designing it for no one. And of course, you know, solutions were looked for and found and eventually what they did was create and design a cockpit with like adjustable seats, adjustable things. So that way the cockpit could adjust to the pilot. And amazingly, or maybe, I mean, looking back on it, maybe not surprisingly, but I'm sure at the time it was, you know, obviously quite a revolution designing things that way, you know, they, they made it so um, a larger audience of people or a larger group of people could be pilots, more people could fly planes, people who were flying planes did better. And essentially what they did by making those adjustable seats and controls was create a diversity of ways to participate in flying a plane, which fits into my favorite definition or the one that really resonates with me of inclusive design, which is this quote here, where it essentially says that inclusive design, what it is, is designing a diversity of ways to participate so that more people or that everyone can have a sense of belonging and more people can use the things that you make. And it's pretty much never a bad thing if more people can use your product or access your content or whatever it might be for your particular case. So, um, you know, especially with, th with this definition of inclusive design in mind, we can take this and apply it to things like animation. Like how do we approach this in a responsible way, in a, in a way that allows us to create that diversity of ways to participate so more people can access and use our content. Always, always a plus, you know, having a bigger audience is never a bad thing. So um, I often talk about, I talk about animation a lot and oftentimes I'm talking about animation and UX. We're not gonna get into any of that today, um, but I do wanna point out that this talk is not about why animation is bad or why you shouldn't use it or suggesting that animation doesn't have potential benefits. Um, I don't believe any of those things. And um, I really, you know, animation absolutely can have a very big impact and positive impact on UX, even usability and accessibility when we use it with intention. Um, there's a lot of positive and potential things there. Uh, essentially it comes down to like all of our design tools, it's the way we use it that makes something have a good impact or maybe a less good impact or even a bad impact depending on how we're judging it. Um, I'm not gonna get into the uh, UX benefits of animation today, but I just wanted to point out all that still holds true. If you would like to learn more about it, I have written a whole book about it and there's also a number of articles from myself and other people around it too. So definitely good to look into if you haven't before, um, but we're gonna focus on the inclusivity side, on the inclusive design side. Essentially, how do we take that, that what we know about animation and UX and use it in the most responsible way. So inclusive design definitely involves more than just being accessible, but I think it's pretty hard to be inclusive if you don't have a foundation of accessibility there to begin with, right? So we're gonna start this journey of making motion inclusive with the web content accessibility guidelines, which I imagine is something you might be familiar with, whether you are or not. Um, there's some interesting recommendations in there that apply specifically to animation. So there's actually three of them um, that, supply, uh, that apply directly to animation. 
The first one is pause, stop, and hide, which um, you can kind of guess what it means or what it's all about from its title. <laughs> it's very descriptive. And essentially it says that you should provide a way to pause, play, or sorry, pause, stop, or hide anything that's moving, basically any animated thing that lasts more than five seconds. Um, and they have kind of a caveat of like, unless it's essential to activity and yeah, that kind of thing. So they have some examples there of what those exceptions might be. But it's an interesting one to look at, especially from the lens of UX design, because initially we might think like, well, we never have anything that goes five seconds long. Like there's no such thing as a five second button hover. I mean, maybe there is, but probably not super common. But this really is something that can come up and apply to our work, even when we're doing UX work, especially when it comes to things like carousels or auto playing videos or any of those things. Anything that repeats infinitely is going to be playing for more than five seconds because infinity is longer than five seconds. Um, how's that for like an understatement of the day? A really great example of this is the figures in the Dark Side of the Grid uh, article series where each one of these figures or most of the figures are an infinitely um, looping animation to demonstrate the concept at hand. And when you're reading this article, you can click that button to have it play. And then you can stop it again when you're done because you've gotten the content you need from that animation and you're good with it and you're ready to go on and continue reading the article. So that's a really great example of just a way that's done, you know, in a way that really fits with the design. You know, like that button fit with the design of the article, it's functional, it fits with the context of what's going on. So a few places where this will often apply, anything that repeats infinitely, um, probably most things that autoplay, you should have a way to stop it. And um, especially when it comes to animated things in the background or animated illustrations that loop. So one of those ones that might not seem super applicable at first, but when you take a step back, you realize like, oh yeah, there's kind of a lot of places this could come up. Of course, the recommendations don't dictate how those should be designed or anything like that, but this is the fact that they should be there. So you have um, the discretion to make it fit with the context of what's gonna be most useful um, for what's going on and what your users might need. The second one is three flashes or below threshold, which little bit harder to figure out from the name, but it very much all has to do with flashing the screen and um, essentially saying not to do that. So um, the full thing basically says not to include any flashes, anything that flashes more than three times a second. And if, and if it does, it should be below the flashing threshold that they put, that they de um, describe. Um, there's a lot of detail provided in the guidelines around what those thresholds are and essentially, if you really have no choice or you really do want to have things flashing, that there are some thresholds that you can be under. Um, but in general, I take this to be just like, don't flash the screen more than three times a second or probably anywhere near that. Um, again, it's one that probably on first read, you're like, oh, I do UX stuff. Well, I don't think this applies to me. But and when I, the places I've noticed it most recently are, you know, sites or articles kind of going for um, kind of like a glitchy vibe or even like a video game-ish vibe. Um, and sometimes those can include things like that start flashing or have flashing like animation. Um, and those are things you want to be, keep an eye out for um, and avoid doing as much as possible. So those two have been around for a while, but there's also a third one that's come up in the most recent version or in the 2.1 version of the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines that's just a little bit different than those two. Um, those two are great ones to keep in mind for sure, but this one gets a little bit um, to a different type of animation. And it's the one around animation for interactions or animation from interactions, sorry. And what it says is that motion triggered by, or specifically rather, motion animation triggered by interaction can be disabled unless the animation is essential for the functionality or information being conveyed. Now, that's not like a super long definition, but there's some terminology in there that might feel a little bit, a little bit hard to understand or just a little bit unclear at first. Um, specifically the term motion animation, because um, most of us, I think, tend to use the words motion and animation interchangeably. Like I know I've definitely been in a meeting probably even like earlier today <laughs> where people were using those to mean the same thing, just a different word for the same thing. And they're, they're pretty close in definition for sure, but 
if we're going to be picky about it, which we are for this particular conversation, because it really does make a difference, um, animation and motion are two different things. So motion animation, the way they define it, it's a little bit long. You don't have to read this all right now. I just want to call your attention to the last line. Or essentially they say that motion animation does not include changes of color, blurring, or opacity. And we kind of get this sense from this definition well, that what they mean is that motion animation is a subset of animation. So you can have animation that does not involve motion, um, but then there's also motion animation, uh, which <laughs> can maybe take a minute or two to like really sort out in your head. Um, but essentially motion animation is a subset of animation at large. So they're talking about, in this case, a specific type of animation. Um, and that's the main point to take away from this. Oftentimes in discussions around animation and accessibility, the conversation starts to be about all animation. And it's just really tough to make decisions when you're dealing with like this kind of ambiguous large thing that's not really well defined. So motion animation really helps us better define what it is we're talking about so we can make you know, more informed decisions and, and just have a conversation um, that actually brings us to some solutions. So probably one of the first things you think of when hearing about this, this uh, recommendation is like, well, why is this there? You know, why is this a thing that might be an issue? And the main reason comes down to this idea or the fact really um, that in recent years, we've come to realize as an industry that some types of motion on screen, even if it's as small as a phone screen, like back in the like, I guess iPhone five screen size days, um, motion on some types of motion on screen can cause negative physical responses for people with motion sensitivities. And I brought up the iPhone as an example there because this wasn't really a thing we discussed a lot in like digital design or like UX design until iOS 7 came out and there was a, um, a really like fast, hugely depthful, like really <laughs> deep transition that came out that was part of the home screen, um, like navigating between the home screen and apps. And once that was released as part of the OS, we started seeing articles and reports of people being like, hey, my phone is making me sick. And that's kind of the point where we realized, you know, us, I guess, as an industry, realized that this was a thing that applied to our work. It wasn't just something reserved for like television and video games. It applies even to designing interfaces and the kind of stuff we might do as UX designers. So interesting turning point. I think it really helps to hear about some first person accounts of what this is all about and like what the experience is like, um, especially if you this isn't something you experience yourself. Um, Eileen Webb has a really great article called Your Interactive Makes Me Sick, talking about her experience with a lot of these, um, or at least a few of these um, very motion intensive illustrative articles and like scrolly telling type experiences um, and how that affects her and her, some of her recommendations around like what we should do about it as designers. So that's a really great one to read. Um, there's also a really good article um, on a list apart, which talking about having uh, a temporary vestibular disorder, the author talks about having a temporary dis vestibular disorder due to an injury. Uh, and this one is interesting for a number of reasons. I mean, they both are super interesting, but um, this idea that, you know, his perspective as a designer of what this was like when he had, when he was dealing with this injury. Um, and also, you know, vestibular disorders is the thing that we kind of most associate, we most associate with emotion sensitivities. And for a lot of folks that is kind of, I guess the root of, of what, um, of their emotion sensitivities. But as he gets into it in this article and other ones you might read about it as well, there, you know, there's a variety of ways that people experience uh, triggers, things that trigger them um, and uh, responses that they might have. So it's not like motion sensitivity is something you can be like, it is, there's not just like one picture of motion sensitivity, if that makes sense. Um, different people experience it in different ways and can have different responses. So it's really great to read some of these first person accounts to get a kind of perspective on how this works. Also interesting about this article, it's not just about motion. There are things that have nothing to do with motion that he found problematic during this time. So interesting to note that the line isn't necessarily drawn just around motion all the time. So 
part of what the web content accessibility guidelines recommend around this is to, you know, they sort of have three ways of thinking about it, where they suggest like, don't use motion, um, don't use excessive amounts of motion, which is like, cool. That's definitely always a good recommendation. You don't have a bunch of stuff flying around the page for no reason, because that's not even really good design, right? Like you want your content and your design to have meaning and intention. And that kind of precludes that. Um, they also suggest taking advantage of user agent and operating system level um, settings around reduced motion, which is where prefers reduced motion comes in. Uh, this is a setting that uh, from the user end of things, we can turn on on all major desktop OSs, Windows, um, OS X, also on iOS and Android and Windows as well. Um, so you can turn this on as a user to be like, hey, you know what, operating system, I like to have my, the amount of motion I see in my operating system reduced. And once you turn this on, um, you will see a reduction in the motion effects in those OSs. And to give you a sense of what it looks like on Mac OS, uh, whether it's iOS or desktop, you get be in a menu, something like this, and you can be like, hey, it's under accessibility and display, and you can turn on reduced motion, and then you will get reduced motion in your OS. Um, the menu is a little different for different OSs, of course, the wording's a little different, but the effect is, is the same. The interesting part for us, folks that work on the web, is that this is also something we can tap into um, as web designers. This is something that browsers have access to as well. Um, for a while, for a long while there, or what seems like a long while, um, it was only Safari that would be able to do this. And now we have some really great browser support. Um, basically, every modern browser out there can, um, can access a user's preference around reduced motion. Um, so browser support, super good. All modern browsers uh, currently support it. And it's a lot of, I mean, there's a lot of green in this can I use chart. Um, one sort of note about it is that awareness of this setting is still growing for sure. And as, you know, um, as is awareness that this can affect um, browser-based content. So um, definitely something that people are still learning about, but the more we use it and the more we use it well, the more trust we can build and the more we can make this a useful feature for folks. So I feel like there's definitely some responsibility on us as the folks making things for the web to use this and use it well to, to provide that more, um, to provide that diversity of ways to participate in our content. So this is something you can access through a media query, which um, the specific code on these slides, not important. Really just the idea is that, hey, however you access media queries and CSS, you can use that to also um, check for this prefers reduced motion value. And same thing in JavaScript, a little more verbose, but same idea. You can take a look at using match media of what has this person selected for prefers reduced motion? What is their reduced motion preference or their motion preference, however you wanna phrase it. And you can check that. If it comes back as true, you can provide a reduced behavior and you know just keep listening to that if it changes. So essentially, or either way, no matter how you go and look at it, the prefers or use motion media query um, can, come, can give you back two results, either no preference, which equates to false, or reduce, which, equa which equates to true. And since you can only get one of two options, there's also a difference um, in, I guess, certainty you can have around each of these values. So the only one you can be 100% sure someone intentionally selected is the value of true. So we know if someone, if it comes back as true, someone has opted in to have reduced motion. If the, if the value comes back as false, that might be because someone has decided I'm cool with all levels of motion, it's fine, I, you know, I, I don't have any preference, or it could be that they just haven't said it yet. So this means that a super clean progressive enhancement of like, hey, I'll check if this is false, and if it is, then I'll layer in all the additional motion effects isn't really a way we can go about this. Um, it, it, it's not a really secure way to go about this as far as like being sure that you're uh, providing the experience that someone has uh, intentionally opted into. So instead we have to take a look for the value of true and be like, hey, this person has opted in to a reduced motion experience. And so if we get a value of true, we are gonna provide, you know, we're gonna reduce the motion for them as needed. So 
with that in mind, you know, where once we get this value of true, what do we do with it, right? What kinds of motion do we need to reduce? We talked about earlier that the web content accessibility guidelines tell us that uh, motion animation is the kind of animation they are, are talking about in this recommendation. Um, but, you know, like, what, let's take a closer look at what that means. <laughs> Examples are always useful. Um, so by their definition of the web content accessibility guidelines definition, they suggest providing a reduced um, alternative or reduced version, however you want to phrase it, for any motion that creates the illusion of movement. Now, um, so generally speaking, what we can take from that definition is that any animation effect that creates the illusion of physical movement is, is one that could be potentially triggering for folks with motion sensitivities. That's like the really long version of that quote, <laughs> or my really long interpretation of that quote, rather. And that's a pretty wide net, and there are definitely type, but there are definitely types of effects that are very commonly triggering for people with motion sensitivities. Um, so I think it's kind of helpful to Definitely this approach of, you know, crazy illusion of movement, that's definitely a candidate for something that should be, have a reduced motion version. Um, but there are some things that I found in my research and talking with folks around this, uh, about this, there are some effects that are definitely like high up on the list of like, these are definitely triggering for a lot of people. Um, so I wanna take a look at some of those. Not that they're the only things you should provide a reduced version for, but they're kind of like, um, we can think of them as like the giant red flags of motion that should have a reduced version. If you have some of these going on, definitely make sure you address them. And then also based on this, you know, anything that creates the illusion of movement is something you should consider as well. I should note before going forward in these, I am gonna show some examples of video with a high amount of motion that is literally examples of motion that can be triggering. Um, all of these are less than five seconds long. I'll let you know when I start them and when they stop. So if you would like to skip them, um, to, be, to be honest, I'm not sure how they come across on Zoom, but I'll give you the option to uh, not watch them if you don't want to, because that's, well, I don't need to explain why, you know why. <laughs> So the first one on the list of things that are just like definitely very potentially triggering for anyone with motion sensitivities are effects that involve spinning and vortex effects. And from the description, you might start to realize why, right? Uh, spinning and vortex stuff that uh, can get us in, it just, essentially what it comes down to is when things are spinning and, and vortexing, I suppose, a lot, um, we get this mismatch of the thing on screen is suggesting that there's a high amount of movement, right? Like you're seeing that and it's spinning and drawing you in visually. And that's suggesting that a lot of motion is going on. But yet you, the person, are sitting here stationary in front of your screen and that mismatch, that kind of discrepancy is, is like that's essentially the core of what makes this a triggering um, animation or emotion effect. So an example of this, um, this is a site will actually have come up twice. We're gonna show what it looks like um, with no reduced motion setting, which is this one here. So if you come to this site, you haven't requested reduced motion. Um, here's what you'll see. I'm gonna start the video. The text kind of drops in, and then we have these little pixel star fields, tiny, it stopped uh, in my video, but on the site, they just go forever and ever endlessly. And it's like a lovely ambient effect, um, but that constant spinning of those stars, even though they're small, especially because they're right behind static, unmoving text that you're trying to read, creates that mismatch of like, hey, there's this, this signal that a ton of motion is happening, yet also I know I'm not moving, um, and that's where this can be very triggering. Um, and with the spinning of vortex effects, the spinning effect doesn't have to be really huge. Like we don't have to go full out 3D vortex for this to be a potentially triggering type of motion. So any type of spinning, um, especially spinning that repeats infinitely, which for some reason, many spinning animations do, um, could be a problem. One note um, that is called out specifically in the web content accessibility guidelines is this doesn't apply to like loading spinners. Um, it's a bit of a different situation and you can look to those guidelines for a bit more of an explanation as to why. So the second one on my list of like things that get called out all the time is like, this is a problem for me as someone who's sensitive to motion is multi-speed or multi-directional movement. Feels kind of a mouthful. And maybe you're think, looking at that and you're like, wait a second, 
that makes me think of parallax. And if it does, you are 100% right, because the definition of parallax is having different objects moving at different speeds. So parallax, by definition, has multi-speed action going on. There's multi-speed, and we often also see some multi-directional action or, or animation happening in there as well. So um, if you haven't seen some parallax in a while, I guess that's kind of a joke because if you look at websites, it's hard to avoid, isn't it? Um, but if you haven't, this is the most multi-directional, multi-speed site I could find. Um, so I'm gonna play it to show you what happens as you're scrolling on that site. As you scroll, you see this. So we have things going up and going down, things coming towards us and then sinking back into space. Um, my video is stopped. But if you were on this site for real, as you scrolled, you would see more and more of that multi-dimensional, multi-speed, multi-directional rather, sorry, and multi-speed stuff going on. And it's a really gorgeous effect if it's, you know, if it's something that won't make you sick, right? <laughs> um, but basically the moral of this pretty little section is that parallax is always going to be an issue or is maybe not always is maybe a little too strong, but every single person I've spoken to, um, who has motion sensitivities to motion on screen has called this out as being a problem. And I have to be honest, I don't consider myself to be emotion or to be to be sensitive to motion on screen. Um, but I have personally run into parallax sites that give me like a weird dizzy kind of just sick feeling. So I feel like, you know, this is a, definitely a thing that if you're using parallax, you want to consider or, or you should very much consider um, providing a reduced version as, of of the experience as well, so that people can actually get to your content. Um, I should note that this isn't to say that parallax is always terrible. I know some people hate it, but even the Nielsen Norman group has some research and, art, and at least one particular article out about how there are places where parallax makes sense. Um, so if you are in one of those cases where you're like, you know what, parallax is what we need for this site and this design, cool. Make sure you also provide a reduced motion version. The last one that I wanted to cover that comes up a lot as being problematic is constant motion near text. Now we looked at that a little bit in the spinning vortex uh, example, but the motion doesn't have to be spinning near text for this to be an issue. And where I feel like I most often run into this is situations like this video I have where um, it's an article, really wonderfully art directed, and there's these animating pull quotes. So I'll show you what these look like. I'll start the video and as we're looking at these pull quotes, the coins in the letters, the words fall out, right? And then they go back in and they fall out again. Um, and my video, my video is done, but if you were actually on this live article, you would just see the coins falling out over and over and over. And like design wise, it makes sense because this is an article about how it's so hard to save for retirement. So get it, the money is falling out, great. But it's pretty tough to read that text on the right side of the screen while that pull quote is constantly animating on the left side. And it's to the point, um, you know, like folks who even, it's not necessarily just folks who have motion sensitivities that have issues with this, it can even be people who have difficulty with focus or attention, um, you know, any of that things, any of that type of situation where something constantly animating next to a thing you're trying to read is gonna pull your attention away or even potentially make you feel sick. So, I mean, this is something that we can also address in a number of ways with the way we build things or the way we design things. We could have these animated pull quotes um, be set up to only play once when they come into view, right? If it just plays once, less of an issue because it's that repeating constant motion that is, is the main um, problematic thing here. Um, or we could have it, you know, or we could also make these res re respect uh, prefers reduced motion. And if someone has come to the site and has said like, hey, my prefers reduced motion is true. I would like reduced motion. Maybe it doesn't animate at all for them. So there's options of what we can do to still have the, um, the design vibe that we want and be creative with our design, but still make it. Um, you do it responsibly and make it safe for folks um, that have motion sensitivities. So those are three big examples of things that are like, yeah, if this is going on in your site, you definitely want to have a reduced version. Um, there's, way, there's lots more examples if you'd like to dig into more. Um, this is an article I wrote a few years back that has some specific examples. It's called Designing Safer Web Animation for Motion Sensitivity. And there's also a great article on the WebKit blog called Responsive Design for Motion, where they go into a number of examples of really, you know, 
large motion effects that are problematic and how they can be uh, mitigated with the prefers reduced motion query. So lots of lots more examples to dig into besides just those three little those three categories. One thing that's not on the list in either of those articles and wasn't on the list of the web content accessibility guidelines either are things are these non-motion effects, right? Things like animated color changes, opacity fades, those sorts of things. Um, and I call this out partly because this seems to be a thing that often gets missed, but also to say that, you know, things like animated color changes and opacity fades, if you are just kind of doing what we might consider like baseline UI animation, right? Some hover effects and things like that, just a little bit of, of animation to help direct or, or give that feedback or affordance of what's going on, you might have no motion animation in your entire project. That's entirely possible. So this is why it's really important to kind of, to take a look at the motion you have in your project, in your product, and kind of judge, and, or exactly judge rather, you know, what kind it is and what category it might fall into. So with all that, how do we re respect these reduced motion requests? I hinted at it a little bit in those examples, but let's break it down. Just to get, we'll get a little more practical with it. So my, prefer, my recommended approach is to identify potentially triggering motion in your product or in your project, um, and then decide the best reduced effect, how, how to best reduce that effect based on the context. And the context is a really important part here. Because if you just decide to like, all right, I'm turning it all off, stop it all, you have no control or even way to know if like you've caused things to break or be unreadable or be impossible to use. So if instead you look at each thing in context, you can make the best choice for how to still have your content be usable and like whatever else it needs to be, you know, have people be able to read it use it, whatever it is, um, but without having the motion effect that might cause them problems. So usually at this point, people are like, oh, that sounds like so much work. But um, in reality, if you have a site that's more um, what I'll call task-based, right? Like an e-commerce site, a site that you go to to read stuff or buy stuff or whatever, that's maybe more transactional. Um, chances are you probably only have a handful or so of effects or possibly none, like I said, that would be potentially triggering. Uh, if you know that you don't use a lot of large motions and you mostly mostly use things like opacity fades or crossfades, um, you know, you probably have a very short list of of animation effects that might be triggering that you would need to address. So don't take this as saying as a thing that's like, oh, there's a ton more work to do. It's really about honing in the efforts, your effort of this, um, where it's needed, and you know, checking if it's needed first and where it's needed, and then addressing those directly. So some more examples. This is exactly the approach that we see in the iOS example that I hinted at earlier. Um, this is the iOS effect that kind of I don't know, set this all in motion. That's a good pun, right? Um, so I'm gonna start my video now to show you the effect. So as we move from the home screen to this particular photo app, you can see that very drastic zoom and it zooms back out and my video is now done, but that is like, there's a lot of ground or virtual ground covered in that effect. It's very, very forceful. Um, the physics are very realistic. You can totally see how that could suggest actual movement um, in, in a way that could be uh, triggering. So if you are on iOS or if, well, I guess if you were and also if you are, cause it still works um, <laughs> and you went into your settings and we're like, hey, iOS, I would like reduce motion. Um, instead of that zoomy effect, you would get this crossfade instead. So instead you would get this. You get this crossfade between your menu, your home screen and the app and the crossfade back and it's a non-motion effect. They've literally substituted a, a high motion effect with a non-motion effect to make it a safer effect and takes the same amount of time, does the same thing, transitions you from the same two things, but does it in a less motion intensive way because that's what you need if you've opted into a reduced motion. To revisit our spinny Starfield site, um, the main reason I wanted to add this, bring this site up in, as my example is it's the first um, the first like non-Apple site I ever saw respect prefers reduced motion, like back when you could only do it with Safari kind of times, back in the day. <laughs> um, so if you come to the same site that we saw earlier with reduced motion set to true, this is what you see. 
So we have, you know, the star field isn't moving, the text doesn't move down, it's already all there. But things like those hover animations that give you that affordance, of like this is a thing to click on, you know, those design details that make it feel like it's a well-designed site um, are still there. So the motion that was potentially triggering, potentially problematic, the star field, the text movement, that was reduced. But the things that are there for important information, like, hey, this is a navigation link, we're still there um, with those non-motion effects. So those are two great examples of how that can be done. Um, there's lots of other ones out there as well. I kind of collect them up as I see them uh, when I see some really good and well done uh, reduced motion uh, solutions. So those are great for sites like these, right? Sites where or you have like, it's mostly content-based, um, but what if you have a site where you're creating an experience, you're telling a story, or you're intentionally relying very, very heavily on motion to um, get your message across. And, you know, maybe it's a fancy data viz thing, a highly editorialized article. There's plenty of places where we might decide that we want to use motion, rely on motion a lot more heavily for our design work. And in those cases, I think the idea of creating a custom motion toggle is a good idea or providing a motion toggle is a good idea. Um, for a number of reasons, if for nothing else, just to make that uh, that the access to a reduced motion, motion version much more immediate and more obvious than maybe the prefers reduced motion setting might be, especially because there's still a level of awareness that we're building up. One of my favorite examples of this, and not just because I've been playing way too many video games the last few months, is the Animal Crossing website, where, I mean, it's a video game. It's about animals. Even if you've never played this game, you're like, you know, this is a place where you're probably going to have some highly high motion effects, a lot of motion, a lot of things going on because it's a game like that is probably in line with your expectations. And that's very much what you see. If you go to the site um, with no prefers reduced motion settings, um, you know, without reduced motion requested, um, you'll see something like this. I'll just give it a play. So as this plays, we see the message bubbles come up. We have this very spinny, very blurred, like motion blur spin effect as we go to the different worlds of the characters. There's even this like balloon particle effect as they take over the screen. And like it fits because this is a video game site, but they also have something interesting here, which is that little, was it, or not that so little, but then the very top in that uh, yellow bar, there's this reduced motion toggle. So. If you have that, if you go and click that, or if you come to the site with prefers reduced motion already set to true, you get a slightly different experience. Where this time when we play it, you know, Tom Nook is there, he fades in and out instead of the fancy um, swirling blur. Uh, we can still access the character's birthday information, but we don't get the confetti balloons. You know, so the content is still there. There's still animation. We still get the playfulness of it. Um, they, you know, they very much preserve the content and the, the vibe of the content, but we have the, the, highly, the high motion effects have been reduced because that's what we wanted and what we needed. And the really interesting thing about, I mean, there's a lot of interesting things about these toggles, but we're in a position these days on the modern web, however you wanna say it, where creating these toggles and making them smart and useful is so much easier and just like um, a viable option than it was even just a few years ago. So like I mentioned, this one's really smart. It looks at whether you've already requested reduced motion from your OS. And if you, um, if you haven't, it offers you this, hey, do you want to have the motion reduced option? And if you click it and then come back to the site two weeks later or whatever, it remembers your choice as well. So if you're wondering how to pull something like that off, Marcy Sutton has a really great example in her making accessible, making accessible web apps, I believe it's the name of the Egghead course, um, and also in this code pen pen, where she demonstrates how you can create a, a toggle that uses things, smart things that we use, you know, in, in modern JavaScript, like components and everything else, um, and uses things like reduced motion, the reduced motion query, and local storage to make a smart toggle that um, knows if you've already requested reduced motion from your OS, and also remembers what you selected when you visit subsequent times. So really smart, very, you know, and it, it's something that we can very much adapt to our content and make those those intelligent choices around the context and what, what's most important there to preserve that meaning. And maybe you're like, oh, toggles, I don't know, that sounds weird. 
we are seeing toggles more and more on websites these days. It's not a weird thing anymore. You know, even Twitter has a reduced motion toggle, which is also a smart one, by the way, that first looks at if you've already asked your OS for reduced motion. And if, if you have, it already sets itself to um, be reduced. And if you haven't, you can make a site specific selection here. So we have them in things like Twitter. We have these settings in so many places. Um, you'll start noticing that toggles and preferences aren't maybe such a strange thing on the web anymore. It's actually becoming kind of commonplace. So why not have one that can, you know, want to have a toggle for people to be able to reduce motion uh, for your own app and experience in a way that makes sense for what you might need to reduce in your project. Um, if you want to dig into more about how to do these, these, like how to reduce motion and what to make these reduced motion experiences like or the code behind them. I have this article on Smashing Magazine where I dig into some of those same examples and also some uh, code behind how those things could work. So that's for you if you wanna dig a little bit more into how these things are possible and not just kind of the, the higher level that, that they are possible. But I think that's the biggest thing is these things are things we can do thanks to like the modern state of the web, we have, these, these tools available to us. So we absolutely should use them to the best of our abilities and you know, to make the best experiences we can. So I hope this has all helped to show you how we can be creative with motion, even like very, very creative with motion while still being inclusive. You know, by identifying potentially triggering motion and mitigating them with reduced motion queries or even a custom toggle, you can expand the audience who can meaningfully participate in the projects that you make. And that's never a bad thing. So with that, thanks so much for listening. I know we're going to do some questions, and I'm always happy to chat about this on Twitter if you want to talk about it more. So thanks very much. Awesome. Awesome work, Val. Thanks. All right. Let's get into your questions. We have quite a handful. So thank you so much for submitting them. Um, I'll try to get to as many as possible. Yeah. All right. So first question here asks, in the second principle you described, your slide noted the exception is, quote, unless the flashing is under the general fla flash threshold, red flash threshold, unquote. Um, can you expand more on what red flash threshold means? Yes. So this is one of the recommendations in the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines that has or at least as far as the motion one goes, like the deepest research behind this, essentially it came from like back in the day of broadcast TV. Um, so there's been a ton of research and essentially why they have two thresholds is the research has found that um, flashing the color red can have um, basically like a, a larger impact. So there's different thresholds for flashing the color red versus not just red things. Um, and they go into a ton of detail on the web content accessibility guidelines as to why and what those thresholds are. But essentially it just comes down to, they have researched this so much they can get it down to that level of detail of like, hey, this color is a slightly different situation than non-red colors. So um, I don't know, I think, I think that's fascinating. <laughs> Hopefully the person who asked also does. Super, thank you. Okay, here is a question. I'm going to attempt to combine two. Um, mm -hmm. So this person says, our designers are always wanting to slide up into, wanting things to slide up into place as they enter the viewport or have images in sl cards slide down, etc." Uh, another person says, our designers are, quote, parallax junkies. Um, <laughs> this person says, even though these are often subtle, they can have negative impacts and asks, um, whether to apply preferred prefers reduced motion to those two, but wasn't sure. Yeah, I mean, I think it, it depends on the, the context. And, and as they kind of pointed out in the question, a card sliding up once is very different than an entire parallax experience as you scroll down the whole page. Um, there's definitely ways these can be made very subtle, like even moving a card up, you could move it up from the very bottom to the very top, or you could kind of move it up from just a little down to a little up. And those are going to be, you know, have a very different impact. Um, so I think it really takes a look at the context. I mean, definitely parallax. Um, but if you have those like slide ups that are very tiny and not remotely even parallax, maybe that's less of a, of, of a concern. Great. Thank you. Uh, here's a question from Annabelle. And I think um, a question about something that we've all seen. 
Um, she asks, do you have any advice on using animated GIFs and emails? We've been seeing more of those and are having trouble stopping or pausing them after five seconds. Ah, yes, that's a good one. Um, unfortunately, I think just in the base, I'm mean, assuming this is maybe HTML emails versus you know, your basic work emails. Um, but I think a lot of that falls on the email client. And I don't know if there's anything we can do as the person writing those HTML emails to make that happen. Um, I have noticed that I'm pretty sure it's Outlook, at least one of the email clients I use does automatically pause and then put a play button on animated GIFs that I get. Um, but then other ones don't. So I don't know if there's any way we can control that or if that is all just kind of up to how the client handles it, like the email client, I mean. Sure. Okay, next question here is, are there any tools your team uses as part of design, development, QA, et cetera, to automatically double check for problems around motion and animation? Unfortunately, no, I don't know of any automated tools. Um, and it's kind of, it, that question's definitely come up before. And there's there's automated tools to check for flashing on like broadcast TV type stuff. Um, but I don't know of any tools for that or any of the other things we've talked about that can do that automatically. Um, if anyone wants to go make one, let me know. Um, but I don't know of any that, that are um, automated tools that we have available to us these days. Gotcha. Okay, uh, next question is, uh, would love to hear your thoughts on the ethics and practicalities of testing for motion discomfort. This person says that they work in video games and sometimes virtual reality and want to play it safe and make educated guesses about what might, might cause discomfort. I think probably the best thing to do is, you know, talk to real people They include some exploration on this in your user testing. Um, obviously you can't have like one person speaking for everyone. And it, it is the kind of thing where, um, you know, I don't think, yeah, like you don't, you might talk to like five people and you get a certain, you can get some ideas of the things that are gonna be maybe most potentially problematic. I think that's maybe um, probably the best way to go about the user testing stuff. Like you can't talk to every single person, right? But you can probably talk to a few people and get a sense of the things that might be most problematic or the things that require the, the highest attention. Um, I imagine that's probably very different for VR and AR things too, because I know, you know, that's a whole different, um, I guess a whole different ball game to get into sports metaphors <laughs> than things on a 2D screen. Um, I imagine there's probably also hopefully a good bit of research around that as well, but it might still be still be developing. Sorry about that. I uh, my mouse right. got disconnected. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, next question is uh, asking if you could provide an example of animation that, quote, is essential for functionality or the information being conveyed, unquote, and does not need, therefore, to be disableable under WCAG. Yeah, oh, that's a good one. Um, the kind of classic, I guess, can I call it classic? I will call it classic we can decide it's classic. Um, example is something like a stock ticker, like an animated stock ticker, right? Stock prices change a lot. <laughs> oh, actually, I just realized that's so much more relevant recently than I thought of at first. Um, but yeah, like if you stop the animated stock ticker, you would stop finding the updated price and then like you would not have critical information that you need to make uh, decisions around stock. So things like that that are time-based. Um, Loading indicators are also called that as an exception. I can't remember if it's to that one exactly, um, but they are called that as an exception to, to some of this in the uh, web content accessibility guidelines, in part because if I, you know, if you pause the loader, how do you know it's still loading? You know, it's like that's critical information, right? Like you have to know that's still happening. So um, those are at least two that I know of that are in there. Um, I'm sure there's probably some other ones, but those are the first two that come to mind that are like, it's very critical to have that timely information. Great example. Okay, we are almost at time. So in the interest of um, making sure everything else runs on schedule today, I think it is time to wrap up. Um, but 
Many, many thanks to you, Val, uh, for an awesome presentation. Thanks to everybody for attending this session and for your great questions and engagement. Um, please enjoy the rest of AxCon and be sure to check out more sessions today. Yeah, thanks everyone.